Hi, I'm Maggie. Hi, I'm Grace, and this is A Very Bookish Podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to a very bookish podcast. Today's episode 86, and I am yet again solo interviewing, but we have a very special guest. We have author Lila Dawes on today, and we're going to be talking about her books, her life. We're also going to be talking about Henry and The Witcher, and we're going to be discussing all of that. So welcome, Lila. Thank you. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Thank you for being on. Um, I always feel so awkward when it's just me and I'm just talking and I'm like, I don't have my partner in crime, Grace, but thank you for so much for coming on. I honestly didn't expect any authors to reach me, to reach out to me when I posted that we're looking for romance authors to interview. So very thankful that you saw somebody, I think reposted it and you saw the post and you message like messaged us. And I was like, thank you. I've been Sweet. looking for people. <laughs> I swooped on that. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love that. I I have been slacking, and so I was like, okay, I'm gonna create this post and actually interview people, so that like I have to do this because I enjoy it. But I'm also very lazy, and I'm like, mm, I don't have anybody to interview. I'll skip this week. So now <laughs> I actually do have people to interview for the next like two months. So I'm so I'm over the moon that you decided to come join us, and really thankful that you came on. And my first question to you is. Would you be able to tell our audience who maybe haven't heard of you or they're interested in knowing more about you, kind of who you are and what you write and maybe your newest release coming out? Um, Yeah, so I'm Lila. I am 35. I feel like this is a, uh, (laughs) like a dating video. (laughs) I'm 35 and I live in Derby in England, Um, Derbyshire, obviously famous for Mr. Darcy um so as soon as you say Derby Chef I was like oh I know where that is <laughs> um it's not it's not as nice as uh, it was uh, in Jane Austen land um <laughs> but I um I currently live at home with my parents so I am living the dream um and I self-published first in 2021 my first book came out um I write small town steamy romance um currently working on the same series uh, which is set in the fictional town of Citrus Pines, which is located in Tennessee, um, in the States. Um, obviously, I'm British, so it's it's uh, been really interesting writing something set in America. Um, and Especially the get, South. <laughs> yeah, trying to get all the, um, the spell, even just like the spelling, and oh, it's crazy. But yeah, um, so there's three books out in the series so far, um, and there'll be another approximately three maybe four to go um and the next one should be due out may june time i haven't revealed any details about it yet other than the couple so um mm. i'll probably uh drop that at some point but i'm very excited about this one so Ooh. i i'm a small town romance girly too so is grace she's been reading i think elise silver right now Ooh. and she's like into like the small town romance and i'm so i'm from texas so I, I'm from Dallas, Texas, though, so I'm from, like, big city south, but still, like, south, so some cowboys and some, like, small town romance, I'm like, oh, living my Texas dream a little bit. (laughs) You don't have that southern, or I can't tell that you're from, like, Texas, you don't have that time. Yeah, I, um, my, my dad's from Ukraine, and so I've, and we've also moved a ton, so okay. I've moved quite a bit in my life. So I never really developed an accent, but I'm also from the city, so it's like I lived da- like I lived in Dallas, and so I wasn't really in the outskirts or anything. But if I'm in Texas and I'm in like the roots, like you start to hear my southern slang, and then I start talking, and I'm like, oh, I need to go back to the city because I do not want to be talking like this for the rest of my life. And so yeah. it's nice, <laughs> I go back, and I'm like, oh, I'm normal again. <laughs> But I do love my Southern accents. I, I I like to say, like, I'm from Dallas, Texas. I grew up in there, and I lived there for 14 years. And then I moved to Kansas City, Missouri. No, Kansas City, Kansas, not Missouri. Yeah, it's it's very different, especially the different Southern dialects as well. Yeah, Very different. Like, Texas versus Alabama versus Georgia versus North Carolina. I'm like, nope, not for me. <laughs> that's like here though you can travel like half an hour up the road and you've got a completely different accent Mm -hmm. different words that people use for the same thing like it's crazy in this country yeah 
when I visited my relatives in London, I like noticed like I would we would go to different parts and I was like, people sound completely different here too. Like I literally would go like a couple blocks and I'm like, this person sounds completely different than the person that we had just talked to five minutes away. And I'm like, yeah. this is crazy. I feel like the English accent so like and then you have like Australian accents too, and they're like, there's so many yeah. different <laughs> I was literally going to say I spent five years living in Australia so oh. and I massively had the accent but then when I came back I got really bullied or it's <laughs> like I dropped it very quickly but now like because I have a day job and I deal with a lot of um, like kind of international companies and stuff whenever I start talking to an Australian person it just comes out of me and I can't mm. stop it and I'm like I'm so sorry <laughs> I'm not making fun of you it just happens <laughs> Where did you live in Australia? I lived in um, Queensland. Okay. Okay. I thankfully know where that is. <laughs> I have wanted to visit Australia and like New Zealand for a long time. And then I was like, mm, everything there can kill me. So I think I'm going to wait. Literally everything there is the deadliest of everything in that like, I don't know how I made it out of my life. <laughs> koala? I'm like, mm. <laughs> I'm like, like a kangaroo. People are scared of kangaroos because those things will fight back. But a koala, I'm like, those things are vicious. Like, I've <laughs> I've I've gotten those deep rabbit holes of like <laughs> watching like koala videos and stuff sometimes. And I'm like, and then I like randomly stumbled upon like a koala attacking somebody. I'm like, mm. nope. I'm gonna I'm gonna stay like thousands of miles away from those people <laughs> and those little creatures. And now I'm on like. Have you ever seen the capybara stuff on TikTok? Yeah. Oh, I'm all over that. <laughs> and I work part-time at a vet clinic and we have yeah. themes and stuff. And so I'm like, hmm, maybe I do like a capybara theme for the clinic for a week. Love it. <laughs> so I know to talk more about you, so I'm not always talking about myself, but what made you decide to write a book in Tennessee, of all places? <laughs> so I'm like... I love small town romance like it's it's my jam it's mm -hmm. my jam um and I just love the idea it literally just I think I was in the shower it was I'd already done a bit of writing like before COVID and I've got like about five different half written books um and then I was listening to like the country music radio channel while I was like working from home over the pandemic I think I was in the shower one day and I literally just heard a phrase and it had like darling on the end of it and then it was like my my main character my first hero was like born while I was in the shower and then I couldn't write anything down because I'm in the shower um and I was like frantically trying to finish getting um clean and they come out and quickly scribble it down so it's just that kind of southern drawl charm you know that 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 hero that you can just picture that's just oh chef kiss <laughs> I I totally I totally get that it's it's yeah. definitely like I that's kind of why I love small town romance because I've been to those small towns and I'm like people are not like this so it's great to read it in fiction where you're like <laughs> oh this is so great it, it just interests me that when I found out that you were from London and I was like wait this is set in America. Like, how did she choose to write that? But I noticed that a lot where people from America will write things in the UK and then people from the UK are like, I don't want to write stuff about here. It's shitty. Let's do America. And I'm like, America of all places. <laughs> yeah. But that's very interesting. Do you plan on writing books set in the UK anytime soon? Or do you want to stick to yeah. the US? No, once this series is done, I will do future US based mm -hmm. ones, but once this series is done, like I've got a, a idea in my head and it won't leave me alone. And it's just like traditional Bridget Jones kind of rom com, like British humor. Like mm -hmm. I just I keep getting like snippets and I just sit there giggling to myself over it. And I'm like, I can't wait to write this one. Um so yeah, definitely write more British in future. Mm -hmm. I feel like American culture we love British culture even though we won the war <laughs> I, feel, oh. I feel like I always have this like, like whenever I feel like whenever have you seen like those trends on TikTok where British people will shit on America and then somebody from America will be like well we won the war so <laughs> nothing to say I don't really care but I always feel like it's so funny to mention as like a funny comeback but I'm not uh, it's just humor but um we, I feel like American culture loves stories written in England. Like Jane Austen, she was my favorite author growing up. Like 
Pride and Prejudice and Emma were my top two books that I read. And my mom introduced me to them. And I was like, oh, I still rewatch those shows as well. I'm like, oh, yeah. these are like, these are like my heart. I love Bridgerton. Oh, oh. <laughs> Bridgerton. I like, I swear, like, I will talk to people here and like, especially men. And I'm like, oh, Bridgerton is so good. They're like, oh, it's so unrealistic. And it's not historically <laughs> accurate. I'm like, it's just written off of a romance book. What do you? <laughs> I'm like if anything you should be learning from Bridgerton because this is what a woman wrote this and this is what we want men to do so it's like yeah. you should be learning from this <laughs> exactly so <laughs> my kind of my thing was is do you have like the written stories that you would like half written were those mostly in the UK or were you always like writing like oh, I'll do like an American story or then like a UK based story. Like what was kind of your process when you had started writing previously before the pandemic? Well, I don't think I was thinking about like where they were set, but it's, it's interesting actually, because they're like um, paranormal romance. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> it's more like about a group of people um, and they're kind of just set in the middle of the woods randomly. Mm-hmm. So it kind of could be anywhere. I didn't put a location on that one um Mm -hmm. but if I thought about it it would probably be set in the states just because of like over here you can go into the woods and you think you're really isolated and then you'll see like 20 people with their dogs (laughs) it's there is no such thing as isolation in this country it's very small and there's a lot of us here (laughs) um so it's probably much easier to work it in the in the Mm -hmm. state um but yeah I think I think it just kind of helps because it's it's like that's the bigger market as well mm-hmm. um and that kind of does factor into some of the decision making sometimes um because if it's if I'm writing British then the language is very different the jokes are different like the humor alone is quite different mm-hmm. and then you don't necessarily want to isolate such a big kind of reader group mm-hmm. um, so I think that kind of plays into it quite a bit but yeah I am very excited to do something British and um and then get back to get back to the uh US roots so when you were writing your at least your small town romance that you're still currently publishing and stuff what kind of like research did you did on like Americans did you do any research on like American slang and stuff like that or were you just kind of like oh I already know all this I'm just gonna write a book about it what was kind of like your process and like did you do any research for that I think, um, I know it sounds ridiculous, but I grew up watching so much American TV um, Mm -hmm. that I feel like that definitely helped give me that kind of culture. Mm -hmm. And obviously, like, it's TV, so it's not real, but there is elements um, Mm -hmm. that are kind of the same. And then I have, um, like, connected with quite a few um, kind of American people through Bookstagram. I've made some friends that are in the States, and not just in the States, but, like, Canada as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so then I'll drop them a note sometimes and be like, how would you say this? <laughs> Is this a word? <laughs> Is this what you say? Would you have a different word for this? Yeah. Um, I did quite a bit of like Google mapping on Tennessee and like working out distances between things and like just the technical stuff. Like the hardest thing I had to work out is for my second book. I wrote, um, it's a, a new sheriff came to a small town. Mm-hmm. And I had no idea how the uh, like the police structure worked. Oh, yeah. I had no idea that sheriffs were separate. And I'd written this like story and I was like, oh, he was working for the police. And then he did this. And I gave it to my beta readers and somebody said that wouldn't physically be possible. Mm-hmm. And I was like, but I Googled for so long to tell me how this would work. And it was, so it's things like that. Like when you get into some of those kind of details and how like system stuff works it's it's so difficult to find answers sometimes I even saw somebody post something on Instagram the other week that was like my American friends how would this happen because I've googled and it won't tell me um so it can be really tough sometimes trying to find out how stuff works yeah it, it's it's definitely interesting because like even on the road I'm like I question it. I'm like what's the difference between a sheriff and a police officer because I'm sometimes looking and there's like a sheriff car and then like five miles later there's like a police car and I'm like what jurisdiction is this like what I have no idea what the reason is and I'm like 
I call 911 and the police show up. When does the sheriff show up? I'm like, I always question that. But then I realized like, oh, sheriff is like a county thing and it's more broad than what a police station would be. And so it's definitely a lot interesting because the definitely different cultures between a sheriff's office and a police office and the views of a police officer versus a sheriff. And so I definitely, I get that. Like, I would even question yeah. that if I was <laughs> writing a book and I'm like, what does a sheriff do? Like, Googled, what does a sheriff do? What is the difference between a sheriff and a police officer? Like, I totally, yeah. I totally get that. Yeah. Um, which leads me, I, I have so many questions. When people talk, I, I end up having like a million freaking questions. Um, so when you decided to like, how did you decide to come to get beta readers? And like, what was kind of the process of developing beta readers and how you got them and that jazz um so like I'd written the first book and I honestly wrote it having no intention to publish it like I didn't think about that at all um and even when I like half wrote all the other ones like there, it was never in my mind that I was gonna do that <clears throat> my mum is actually an indie author but she writes um like crime and and like cozy mysteries and that kind of stuff so and she'd been doing it for about 10 years and even then I was like no nah, no, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think I'm any good, I don't know. Um, mm-hmm. But then when I wrote um, the first book, I was just so in love with it. And it was such a born of so much love that um, I was like, do you know what? Let's, let's see, let's mm-hmm. see what's going to happen. But then you kind of have to understand that your opinion of your work is one-sided. Um, and I joined... Um, bookstagram obviously mm-hmm. to start getting myself out there and I met loads of really amazing readers and writers um and then I just kind of reached out to a couple of them I think somebody reached out to me first and asked me to read their book mm-hmm. um and then somebody else reached out to me and said oh so and so said you gave great feedback can you read mine and then I was like okay well can you both read mine mm-hmm. um, and it kind of went from there and it's really um it's it's really difficult to get that sweet spot of how many to use because everyone's got a different opinion on how stuff should be mm-hmm. so it's having so you don't want too many I think I sent it out to about 10 people the first time and then so many there were so many different people's opinions and it was really hard to kind of pick the nuggets out of mm-hmm. what, okay what does the majority think um yeah. and then it's really hard sometimes to also step back and be like oh but I thought my book was fine and actually Mm -hmm. it's missing this or it needs this um but I think bookstagram definitely is full of amazing like beta readers alpha readers um and I've got my critique partners now who kind of we all work together and then I get that from the author point of view and Mm -hmm. then I'll reach out to betas again to get it from a reader point of view to make sure it works from both perspectives yeah that yeah that's <laughs> so, no 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 that's perfect I mean it helps me think about my next questions because I have so many questions that I'm like oh fuck, which am I gonna get a pick <laughs> but that remind you mentioned that your mom is an indie author so like do you is your ultimate goal to do like tradition I don't I don't like this I like to say big publishing when I say like traditional publishing I like to say big publishing because traditional publishing now is either big publishing or being an indie author I feel like that has been like indie authors are more popular now I feel like and we see big publishers picking up those indie authors so do you want to be like a big publisher or have you always just wanted to do just indie auth be I guess you haven't thought about publishing but when you decided to publish were you like I want to do indie author or were you like maybe if a big publisher does want to pick it up I might do that or what was kind of your thought process for that I am I always just went down the indie route because I honestly didn't think I was, I could do it the other way. I didn't mm-hmm. have confidence in it. I was like, I think there'll be people that enjoy my stories, but I don't know. I don't think like a publisher is going to be like, oh my God, this is amazing. We need it. So mm-hmm. it kind of never occurred to me to go down the trad pub route. It mm-hmm. was always indie. And then the other thing is, is like, I like having the control over what I put out. Mm-hmm. Um, going kind of going back to the beta reader thing when I um <clears throat> was working on my first book um and getting it ready I submitted it to somebody who is traditionally published she um she's um got quite a few books out and she is yeah she's traditionally published and she does um editing and reading for people and helping you get your submission ready for 
trad pub mm-hmm. and I gave her the first I think it was 18 pages and not knocking this woman at all she was amazing she gave me some great feedback but the amount that I would have needed to change the first 18 pages of my book mm-hmm. it made it a completely different story mm-hmm. and then I was like no what I I want the story I've got I feel yeah. like I'm quite I've got a lot of experience with reading romance um I knew it didn't necessarily hit all of the beats but it hit enough of them that I felt like it was going to be okay and then when I kind of thought well if I do want to do this I've got to change this 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 and this or I could not do that and Mm -hmm. be happy with what I've put out rather than somebody else's work um so I think I'd definitely stick to indie authoring um Mm -hmm. sometimes I think oh it'd just be nice if somebody could come and take some of this stuff away from me so I can breathe for a bit because the the writing part is massively like overshadowed by all the business kind of side of it and sometimes that can get a bit much but yeah I like control (laughs) I feel like a lot of the big publishers are now trying to understand that because we see like Bloom is starting to pick up like Anna Huang and Emily McIntyre and like all of these like big indie authors who wrote stories that I feel like wouldn't have been traditionally published or big pub published through big publishers because of the content and the style of writing and stuff. And I feel like I think big publishers are starting to realize, especially with the rise of book talk and bookstagram of like, oh, this is what people want. And we've been slacking a little bit when it comes to diversity and di- not just diversity of people, but diversity of romance and the different genres of darker romance becoming very popular within the last few years i didn't know what dark romance was maybe three four years ago i was like what is that and then now i'm like oh yes like mafia i want the main character to kill for the female like stalker romance savar miller is like savar miller is my goddess i love her and she writes her whole like series i i adore her and the amount of like love I have for dark romance has grown and I feel like traditional published uh big published houses are now starting to realize that and starting to pick them up more and we see that and so I find that very interesting would you be all right if like a big public a big publisher reached out and you're like hey we want to publish this series for you what would you what would your response be would you be like sure or you'd be like "Mm, no I'd be like I have conditions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is, I'm probably guessing, which is With what, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so which maybe. a lot of them are like, well, I want to still publish what I want to write. Like, I feel like that's what makes indie author so much more attractive is that they're able to write those darker themes or write certain scenes that big public, big publishers would have been like, hmm, we're cutting that. Yeah. And readers are like no we want that scene put that scene fucking in (laughs) like we want like she's slurping on she's giving that glug glug 3000 like yes like I want to read that and so I totally understand that's why I kind of gear towards more indie authors is because just I mean I have like you can see like my traditional published books are all back here and like right here but I have a full like bookshelf of just indie and stuff and most of these are like indie authors on my it's a lot (laughs) it's a lot that I have I have a ton of books and my parents are always like Maggie how do you have so many fucking books I'm like "Hmm." (laughs) Um, so I haven't told you yet but I have a podcast and I have a bookstagram and book talk page like I'm sorry (laughs) um but yeah I totally totally understand that which I know this is a complete 180, but I did scroll to the bottom of your Instagram feed. Oh no, <laughs> what horrendous things did I post when I first started? <laughs> well, I right. just saw your um, leading men in romance novels and <laughs> the men are like, I feel like Book Talk's favorite people, but Henry okay. is in, in the picture, which leads me to... The Witcher. And I know we've been talking about books, but I gotta talk. I guess The Witcher is technically books. And Henry, what are your thoughts on Henry leaving The Witcher and then replacing him with Liam? Absolute devastation. <laughs> Complete intelligence. I was like, I think I read it and I was like, oh, that's really funny. And then kept scrolling 
like I just assumed it was a joke and then like I feel awful for Liam Hemsworth can you imagine oh, like, yeah. being Liam and being like oh, I've got this amazing new role and everyone's absolutely hating on you I mean <laughs> I mean with also Miley Cyrus's new song you're like oh. <laughs> you're horrible yeah I feel like there's going to be an announcement soon that it's no longer Liam either <laughs> yeah well like I also Henry was a fan of the books like he's a total nerd like have you watched this video of him building a PC like it is the Please. hottest thing it is the hottest thing ever and my number one saved video <laughs> it's been watched a lot and like the edits on TikTok of that video I, I I'm a sucker for them but he was like a genuine fan of the books and of the character and he put a lot of effort into it and to hear that the Netflix decided to go a different different route and that's why he left. And you're like, how bad is it that he decided to leave and he's yeah. doing his own TV show now? How bad is it going to be when Liam Hensworth gets on there? I, and yeah. Honestly, I, he was the only reason I watched it. I didn't know anything about The Witcher when I went into it. Mm -hmm. He looks good in it. Um, yeah. He's my man. I back mm -hmm. my man on <laughs> said like we're like you know like he knows who I am yeah <laughs> um, oh yeah I he's like the love of my life he just has no idea like <laughs> we're married but he doesn't know it so exactly. it's okay um and I had thought that it was going to be like a love story in mm -hmm. that he would be looking for her and he would find her when she was a bit older she was a bit young um mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden they would meet and fall in love and when it went down like the daughter route like the mm -hmm. romance author in me, like it was like a rallying cry. I was like, no, no, this is not what I wanted. Having had no idea what it was about mm -hmm. and just watching it for him. But I did get sucked into the story, but I'll give, I'll give Liam a go, but I'm, yeah. not, I'm not holding out much hope. Well, we I do feel have... like it's going to be one episode and then done. Maybe. Yeah, we have one, I guess season three is still Henry and then season four will be Liam but I Yennefer and his relationship I was like mm, this is good and I like that it differed from the books because I knew it was a book series and a game I had no idea what they were about and then I started watching I think a lot of people at least were watching it because of Henry like that was the main thing is like oh Henry Cavill in Cavill in medieval times where like swinging a sword around like mm, have you not seen the Tudors like he was also in the Tudors in just him in med medieval gear I'm like oh Theo James I watch Sandington and him also in like Regency era I'm like oh I know. this is this is this is what I need like British men in like old times I'm just like mm. my heart is pounding yes, I'm like oh I get a little tickle in my stomach stomach <laughs> or down there and I'm like oh this is fun <laughs> so what? My mom was so devastated when Theo mm -hmm. abandoned Sanditon that we haven't seen the next series. Like, we just won't watch it. I, it. yeah, I won't spoil what happens, but I, I think I cried for like a solid 30 minutes. And then I was like, okay, next episode. And I finished, <laughs> I think I finished both seasons within a night. And I yeah. have been waiting for the third season to come out because I think it comes out next week. And I've been like, God, I can't watch this. And it was so, it was good. But I was like, oh, it will not be the first season. And the first season was just so good. And I'm so mad about what happened to his character. And I'm like, no. And I was just like, oh. You know who I have become obsessed with, though? So the guy in the first series who plays, is it the farmer guy? Who's in now in Vikings with, like, hair and beard. Yes, and yes, yes, yes. There are so many reels I got lost in reels of him because he has aged beautifully. And Dude. he's got the scruff, he's got the dirty, mm -hmm. bit rolling around in mud kind of vibe. He's yeah. Just, yeah. I I saw, I think a TikTok, and it was like, they should have had Mads Michelson, I think that's how you say his name, oh, yeah. um, as the Witcher, like an older version of the Witcher. Because yeah. he, yes, like that... Him. Oh, he was, like, per he was perfect for that. I think I even mentioned it to one of my friends. I was like, "Have you seen this? This would be such a better idea." Yeah, like <laughs> he is. I feel like he is an older. He's a great. He's a silver fox. He's like. Mm, I feel like all the book talk girlies like secretly love him, and especially him and Hannibal was like. Yeah, you got to see his dark side, and you're like, 
oh, and he always plays the villain, and you're just like, I get a little tingly down there when I see him <laughs> on screen. <laughs> but yeah, I definitely, my mom had sent me a message about the, she had sent it to like after I had found out, and I was like devastated. I was like, I'm not watching this now after the third season. They're probably honestly going to cancel it, I feel like, because of the amount of hate. And Netflix has a has a history of doing that, canceling good shows because they're just bad after a couple seasons. But I was so devastated. My mom was like, I don't have anything to live for anymore. Like, I love Henry. And I'm like, well, he's going to have his own series, Warhammer. It's going to come out. So we just have to wait for that. And Amazon's picking that up. So we'll be able to watch it. But it just was so good to see him. And I feel like he he embodied Geralt's personality and stuff. Even though, yeah. like, he, he's such a cinnamon roll, like, in real life. He's so sweet. He's a gentleman. Have you seen those videos of him, like, helping his fellow, like, actors yeah. down the stage and, like, his co-stars, like, helping them down the stairs and stuff? I'm like... Oh. He's just wonderful. He's, he's just... So- yeah, the, the aren't words. Mother <laughs> Teresa and Henry, like, on my side, honestly. My best yeah. friend, she does not fancy Henry Cavill at all, and it has been a point of contention... But she watched The Witcher and she messaged me. She was like, I get it now. I yeah. get it. I was like, yes. Like yes. British men in silver hair, just it's Game of Thrones. It just yeah. does something for me where I'm like, oh, okay. I just gotta take a couple deep breaths. I'm like, hmm, this is very interesting. I'm feeling something deep down. Like it's so good. <laughs> Even taking it right back to like Orlando Bloom, Legolas. Long, long that's, mm-hmm. what, that's, that's it it's just it's peak it's peak. it's it's honestly like I feel like Netflix just needs to have constant shows of <laughs> men in silver wigs like British men in silver wigs and we're like perfect because like the American market we love British men <laughs> in silver wigs like I definitely have thought about writing a book about a like it would be like a guy with a British accent with silver hair like I definitely have written like a work in progress about that never going to publish it but it's something that makes me happy and I can write the little sex scenes about it and I'm like he's gonna do this to her and she's gonna grab his hair and it's gonna be like silky soft and it's like something that I would imagine like it's just uh and like are you a fan of Game of Thrones too I've watched I have watched it Mm -hmm. I wouldn't oh everyone's gonna hate me I I found it quite boring Mm, I I did struggle with it Mm -hmm. like the first couple of series like the big episodes were great but Mm -hmm. you know I was a bit like oh yeah (laughs) yeah I felt like I was definitely watching it only for certain characters and then I kind of was like I'll read the books and then I was like okay the the tv show I kind of like better than the books um (laughs) but a lot does happen but yeah I totally understand that like some people just aren't into that kind of style too um george rr R. martin is definitely a particular author and particular yeah. man so <laughs> it definitely i definitely prefer men and women written by women is something that i prefer to read and i feel like a lot of men don't understand that when it's like the women that men write are like big boobs small waist mm-hmm. big butt so proportionally inaccurate and like is always down to fuck and i'm like <laughs> you don't know anything about female rage or the female character because I swear to God, a woman, I think it was Anna Taylor joy. And have you seen, I think it's called the menu. It's that movie. Oh, well she was doing an interview and the director had said that like in one of the scenes, she was going to have like a single tear and she was going to be crying. And she told the director, she's like, no, the female rage in me, like if a woman in this particular instance would be so fucking angry and would go off on him. Like, we would not be crying like we might be crying because we don't know how to handle the emotion that's mostly why I cry but it would be the rage that women would feel in this scene and so they changed it because of that and I'm like this is why women are so much better than men. I love um that uh it's it's been around for a long time but it's that meme where a man has written a woman <laughs> all about I think is it she's walking downstairs and she's like she breasted boobily down the stairs. and that just oh my god it just absolutely kills me every time because you're like yeah it's 100% facts <laughs> like it's so funny too I think I saw a meme where it was like the the 
bartender sets down my drink and her boobs jiggle as she sets it down. And I'm like, oh. I'm like I sometimes I like genuinely think I'm like, how did people come up? Like, how did a man sit there and write this? And was like, yes, this is what's going to happen. And I'm like, they're mostly writing towards a male audience. So that would make sense. Is that what they would think? But then you're like, the men in these books are like, Ugh, shitty. And that's yeah. why I think if I ever have a partner, I'm going to be like, you have to read this romance book. Like you have to at least research a little bit about what I want and understand like what romance is to me. Like you don't have to yeah. be this like, I think there's a lot of things that people are like, oh, romance is so unrealistic. And I'm like, romance in these books, most of the men hit like the bare minimum, like <laughs> yes. bare minimum. You all are below the bar. Y'all are the bottom of the barrel men. Like if anything, this will help you. Like this will help you be a better man. Maybe not to me, but maybe to another woman. Like yeah. you need to read this. Cause I feel like a lot of men don't get that insight into what a woman thinks of a man and what a relationship means to them. And I feel like romance does have that ability to give that to us and kind of give women a voice of feeling safe with yeah. a man so I I totally get that yeah also I just struggle with like okay so when did um mutual orgasms and respect become like mm -hmm. a huge unrealistic <laughs> yeah like, no, no, we need to close the orgasm gap yeah. yeah. and then let's bring the respect up as well <laughs> Yeah, I definitely, I feel like that is also, I feel like something that a lot of people don't get out of romance books is like, because I feel like as women, we're like, oh yeah, this is so normalized now. Like both of them should be orgasming. But then like men are like, what? And then they realize like half of us fake it all the time. <laughs> I'm like, sweetie, I think I read, it's the Bromance Book Club. Have you read that? I've, I haven't. I've got it on my shelf. It's, it's so great. good. It's I've read ready to go, but my TBR is ginormous. But oh. I'm getting closer to them. I'm very excited to get to them. Yes, the first book is basically. It's not a big spoiler, but he basically doesn't realize. He realizes that his wife has been faking orgasms for like their whole entire marriage until he actually gives her a real one. And it's like this whole thing. It's like the big story arc of the book. And I, when I read that, I was like, oh my gosh, like this is so real like this is so funny and to, I love the, I love the bromance book club like it's so nice to honestly read a romance book from a guy's perspective being the guy being the main character it's really nice and I really enjoy it so that's why yeah. I do love those books even though it's written by a woman too yeah in fact it is written by a woman so I don't know how accurate it is to a man's thoughts but it's nice at least to have some fiction of it so well, I had a friend who she gave her book to a man to be to read for like a bit of balance. And he basically was like, men would never say this. Men would never think this. This would never happen. And I'm like, and this is why we don't write about you. <laughs> this is a... She was like, oh, he said it was nothing like that. And I was like, and you're surprised? <laughs> There's a reason we write about them. I don't actually want them. <laughs> Yeah, I I seriously think if like there was somebody who could literally like magic fictional men into real life men, I feel like normal men would be just they would be gone. Like yeah. they would they would die out because women yeah. would not want to deal with their bullshit anymore. And yeah. we'd be like, oh, we're done. We're finally done with you. Like, bye. And then they'd be like, what? Why? This is so this is what? I never saw this coming. And it's like didn't you? <laughs> didn't you? Didn't you? So yeah, I totally, I, it's so funny when I, I think I've tried to get one of my guy friends to read a romance book and he's like, I feel so awkward reading this. And I'm like, why? And he's like, it just feels so unrealistic. And I'm like, why? And he's like, well, guys never do this. And I'm like, why do you think that? And he's like, I just never thought of it like this. I'm like, mm, interesting. <laughs> and that's the problem. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh, interesting reaction there bud so I definitely I definitely men just eh. real men eh. fictional men have my yeah, heart yeah. except <laughs> real man Henry Henry right. real man oh, he is a, he's he's a man written by a woman and like yeah. I feel like 
that is the greatest accomplishment a man can get is if you're complimented by saying you've been written by a woman. Yeah. You're set. You're set for life. Like that means you're doing great, sweetie. Like keep it up. Like <laughs> keep it up. You're perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, kind of to end this podcast, is there anything that you'd like to tell our audience? Maybe about following you, where they can find you, if you have a newsletter that they could sign up for, anything about that? Yeah, so I'm on Bookstagram or Instagram rather, Facebook, I'm on TikTok and make, <laughs> I think they're funny. <laughs> Not everyone finds them funny, <laughs> but I make um, a lot of reels and I do like mix up. So I do like book content and like trends and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got a website now and you can sign up for my newsletter there. And I do a monthly Henry comes with my newsletter. So you get a different Henry each month. At Christmas, Festive Henry was out and about. Ooh. Got two of those. Um, and yeah, you can sign up and that's at lilodoorsauthor.com. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, my newsletter comes out once a month and you'll get first news on any cover reveals, books, anything like that. So with um, a release coming out soon, um, you'll get first dibs on all the info there. So yeah, it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a good one. And I just chat about life. Oh, that's great. So thank you, everybody who has listened to this episode. Thank you, Lila, for coming on. This is a great episode. I know it's a short one, but I've tried to keep these episodes short for you guys. I know y'all prefer the shorter episodes, so I decided to make it short, but I know we will probably talk after this. So everybody, we'll, I see you in two weeks, and make sure you go and follow Lila on everything. I'll have them all linked down in the descri- description. Sorry, my my brain is talking faster than my <laughs> mouth actually can. It's all the Henry. It's, it's all the Henry. Henry. It's just I'm so nervous talking about Henry. <laughs> um, so thank you everybody who's been listening, and I hope to see you soon. And we'll see you guys later. Bye. <laughs>